I'm requesting. Um, right. Are we okay to start? Can we start? I keep hearing it. Uh, okay, all right. I wanted to make sure I keep hearing it stop and start. Um, I want to just thank um, the Department of Healthcare Administration, uh, their leadership team for making uh, tonight possible. I know that there's so many of you that have worked on this uh, speaker series. I've heard some different names. Uh, Professor Nago, I believe it is. Um, Professor uh, Brenda Freshman. Um, I think Professor Orlano has been involved in this. Um, Alinda Martinez, and I see many of you, even student-led leaders who are involved, and I just really applaud you for um, rolling up your sleeves and having the ability to tap other people on the shoulder to volunteer. People underestimate the strength and the power of volunteering, and I just want to applaud you for uh, your role and your leadership uh, in putting this night together. Um, just introduction for myself, um, our organization, <clears throat> Um, we are a patient provider advocacy group, and uh, we actually provide regulatory claims representation, education, outreach, and patient advocacy that restricts third-party payers from making medically inappropriate decisions. Um, we understand that we have a responsibility uh, to ensure that providers can advocate for medically appropriate health care in the state of California, and we do this with the support of a case called Wickline versus State. I'd like you to write that down. We'll talk about it later, Wickline versus State. Um, this gives us the ability to ensure that all providers have access to the education, the outreach, the technology, the resources, the administrative laws that they need to protect public health and safety. As leaders, we have a responsibility to lead and empathize and manage the human lives entrusted to us. Um, and we must not only guide with our words, but we must hear with our hearts. Uh, in other words, the herd must be heard. Um, the people we've learned of the, over the course of 20 something years, people just don't want our leadership. Uh, they want our empathy. They want our understanding. They wanna know they're part of something bigger than just us. And I want you to write this down, a change is necessary for growth, but character fuels change. Character fuels change. In other words, if people trust us, they will follow us. Uh, my first training class 20 something years ago uh, involved uh, three people that attended. It was a free session, an elderly lady with cancer, <clears throat> a uh, office manager of a gentleman by the name of Dr. Nagurney. He's in Long Beach. And Dr. Nagurney had a very interesting um, treatment for cancer patients. He would take a biopsy of the cancer. And then instead of just rolling the dice and putting certain chemotherapy mixtures on cancer patients that could possibly wear them down and kill them, he decided he would test certain chemotherapy mixtures on the biopsy. And whichever was successful, he would recommend it. Um, he was getting a lot of denials at the time of investigation or experimental treatments. And uh, this patient was there trying to get her health plan to approve Dr. Nagurney's care. And uh, we did the seminar and uh, along with the patient and the office manager, there was a lady who was there who was a part of the billing agency for Dr. Nagurney. And after the session, they came up to me, or the lady did, of course, and she said, hey, I belong to the California Billing Association. I would love for you to come and speak there. And so watch this. This free session turned into a paid session in San Ramon with about 12 people. Uh, I did that session. And afterwards, there was a lady there. She belonged to the California Ambulance Association. And she came and said, hey, this is a great session. I would love for you to come to Sacramento and do the same thing. And that session, that 12 person paid session turned into a 200 person paid session in Sacramento. That was 20 years ago and we still train 
the California Ambulance Association today. And so um, over the course of time, we've learned that when you are willing to give yourself away, expecting nothing in return, to build yourself as an authority, people will give you permission to do your finest work. And so uh, the real question is, can people trust you? Can they follow you? Can they trust you with patient lives, uh, uncompensated medical dollars, with the healthcare delivery system? Can they trust you with your area of responsibility? Uh, when I first started uh, in advocacy and revenue cycle, we were appearing free in free seminars. We were writing also uh, free articles. Um, our, our goal was to make sure that we gain influence in the field or the area that we wanted to impact. And so uh, tonight I wanna just show you how important it is that you do that as a HCA student. Uh, healthcare providers, uh, they find themselves with a new role as a patient advocate. I want you to write that term down, advocate. An advocate uh, defined is one who defends the rights and causes of another. One who defends the rights and causes of an underrepresented group of people. One of the most cited cases uh, in managed care liability and advocacy is the case of Wickline versus State. I gave you that earlier. Uh, in that case, Lois Wickline was cleared for an abdominal aorta surgery. Her treating doctor wanted to observe her condition for eight days. Medi-Cal, a federally funded payer, would only grant a four-day authorization. Uh, the doctor told, uh, the, the health plan told the doctor rather, uh, doctor, if you believe it's in your best medical judgment to keep the patient for eight days, you should do that. But if you do, we'll only reimburse you for four days. The doctor released the patient after four days. She suffered an infection in her leg. And in 1977, they amputated her leg or she would have died. Well, she sued some people. She sued the entire state of California, which was the health plan, and all of the healthcare providers. You can probably guess who she won against. Uh, the health plan or Medi-Cal got off. She won against the providers. And here's what the Court of Appeals held uh, in that case. Number one, patient who is harmed when care which should have been provided is not provided should recover from all responsible for deprivation of care, including when appropriate healthcare payers. They also said this, third party payers of healthcare services can be held legally accountable when medically inappropriate decisions result from defects or designs or implementation of cost containment mechanisms. Lastly, they concluded, the physician who complies without protests cannot avoid ultimate responsibility for the patient's care. And finally, Medi-Cal was not liable for the discharge decision. Uh, it's real simple. In this case, the patient should have been kept for eight days and the four denied days should have been fought or appealed through the revenue cycle process, which we'll discuss today. Under existing California law, uh, providers are encouraged to advocate for medically appropriate health care. Uh, the law that you're looking at now on your screen is California Business and Professions Code 510. That term to advocate for appropriate health care means to appeal a payer's decision pursuant to the grievance or appeal procedure. Uh, in this case, a grievance would be a patient um, um, appeal letter written, and an appeal would be written by the provider themselves. But also that definition means to protest a decision or policy or practice that the provider or the practitioner believes impairs their ability to provide medically appropriate care to their patients. Now, that term healthcare practitioner may seem a little nebulous. I'll give some definition to it. It includes a licensee in the state who is licensed to practice medicine, of course. But look at number three, it also includes an individual, a non-clinician, where the individual is granted the right to appeal denials of payment or authorization for treatment under the contract. Public policy laws uh, are enacted for public good. They ensure patient access and timely reimbursement in the revenue cycle for medically necessary care. Why is this important? I want you to write this down. Because a provider's ability to practice medicine 
is the direct result and product of cash flow. Without payment, they cannot provide care. You can imagine how difficult this pandemic has been for healthcare providers. Uh, we have seen 47 in 2020 alone, 47 hospitals either close or go into bankruptcy um, due to uh, low patient volumes. Uh, now that could run counter to what we've heard in the news. We've heard that uh, hospitals are, fill, are filled um, in the pandemic year, but in many stretches of 2020, the hospitals were empty because people were afraid to go to the hospital. They were afraid because they were going to catch, if they were afraid that they might go to the hospital and contract COVID. And so the low patient volumes, the elimination of elective procedures, higher expenses, also tied to a cost crunch, where we found that $323 billion was lost in the process. Uh, someone just uh, turned their microphone on. Can you make sure you're muted for this session? Uh, appreciate it. I got a loud, loud part of feedback. I want to make sure you can hear me really, really well. Uh, and so you'll, you'll see that uh, many providers were struggling in this time during the pandemic. And of course, as we've seen COVID numbers increase, we've seen surges in the healthcare delivery system. And we understand that uh, the healthcare, the emergency healthcare delivery system is one that must be defended. Over 39 million Californians rely upon it. 329 million uh, citizens in the, in the United States rely upon the emergency healthcare delivery system, which is really highly dependent upon revenue cycle management. How do we defend the healthcare delivery system? By, by training and releasing our influence and our presence and our passion into people like you. People who throughout a pandemic have studied remotely and made a decision not to quit the pursuit of a higher education. We do it by streamlining administrative laws throughout the revenue cycle as well. Um, what is revenue cycle management? It is the, the, the financial process that healthcare providers use to manage administrative and clinical functions associated with patient demographic and authorization capture, utilization review, claims processing, payment, and revenue generation. This process helps them identify gaps and ensures the management and the recovery of uncompensated medical dollars to keep their doors open. Uh, I've decided to give you a bit of a, a graph that will help you understand uh, revenue cycle. It's comprised in three cycles. Number one is the front end of the medical cycle. Number two is the mid cycle and three, the back end cycle. Uh, here are some of the positions you could fill in the revenue cycle. And uh, just as you're taking a look at it, someone unmute yourself and tell me what positions might we find in the front end of the revenue cycle based on this graph. Someone unmute and just talk to me a bit. What positions do you feel we might see on the front end as you're looking at this graph? Receptionist. Prepayment by DRG. Yeah, so, so see where it says pre-registration and registration. Can you see that? I want to make sure you can see the same thing I'm looking at. Yes. Yeah. Pre-registration, that's, that's where it starts. Uh, and pre-registration, uh, for instance, that's when surgeries have been planned and it's required for a healthcare provider to call a health plan to obtain an authorization for the services the patient's going to receive. And then when the patient arrives on the day of the surgery uh, or the day of the treatment, uh, then of course, to verify the patient is still eligible. Uh, oftentimes the authorization of the service and the actual day the service takes place spans two months. And if you're not careful, uh, the patient may have failed to pay their premiums and coverage was terminated. So that extra call on the day of the services ensures that you receive reimbursement for the services that you've rendered. Uh, if you can obtain an authorization, uh, then you can utilize an administrative law that we love here, Health and Safety Code Section 1371.8. Write that down. 
Health and Safety Code Section 1371.8. And it states that a healthcare service plan that authorizes a specific type of treatment shall not rescind or modify that authorization for any reason once the healthcare provider treats pursuant to the authorization. And so it's important to capture an authorization for pre-registration uh, planned surgeries or treatment. And then of course, registration are for unplanned services, let's say through an ER. Uh, you of course have probably gone to an emergency department and you've seen a registration booth uh, where someone's sitting behind plexiglass well, everyone's sitting behind plexiglass. Uh, uh, but, but I think you understand what I'm saying. Registration is the process where you've gone into the emergency room. They're going to triage you to determine if it's a true emergency. They might put you in the back behind a curtain. And then once they've determined that you're okay and it's not an emergency, they will capture patient demographics from you. Uh, then, of course, insurance verification and admission kicks in to capture these data fields. And here's some of the data fields you could experience working in the pre-registration, registration, insurance verification, uh, slash admission process. Uh, you'll find that they'll have you collect patient demographics. Um, they'll have you identify if it's a scheduled or elective surgery, or if it's an ER related care under patient type there on the right. Uh, who the insurance company is, that's really, really important. The type of insurance, if they're an HMO, a PPO, an ERISA plan, a Medicare Advantage plan, because the timeframes to bill claims and to um, receive reimbursement hinge on the jurisdiction type. And then, of course, verifying benefits. Uh, if the patient has a deductible, if they have a copay, uh, if there is a lifetime max, if they've met their deductible inpatient, in-network deductible, if they have not, what's the remaining deductible amount? So you can ensure that you collect the amount of money needed from the patient when they leave. And then of course, uh, there's a section for the HMO or the payer where they're calling to determine if pre-cert is required and they're listing the authorization number. Uh, at the very top of this screen, you'll see that with our provider members, we provide uh, some of the statutory language that shows the timeframes that plans must respond. Uh, according to Health and Safety Code section 1262.8, write that down. Health and Safety Code, and you can just uh, write H and S code 1262.8. Uh, I'll give you a second one, 28 CCR 1300.71.4. Uh, those respective laws give a health plan 30 minutes to respond to a request for an authorization. Should the health plan fail to respond within 30 minutes and the patient is discharged, all services are deemed statutorily authorized. Now, I have you write those down because just your knowledge of some of the codes I'll give you today will help distinguish you from other applicants when you apply for jobs at hospitals. The fact that you know this will immediately set you apart because it's very rare for a student, let alone even an individual who's worked for years to know these laws that I'm sharing with you today, the administrative law process. Uh, we've talked about the front end of the revenue cycle. Let's continue. Uh, the mid cycle of the revenue cycle is utilization review. These are your case managers who follow up the request for an authorization. Uh, and they send, or they might send the initial one, and they send clinicals to the health plan. Uh, why? So the health plan can review the utilization of care to issue authorizations. That's why it's called utilization review. Uh, if a denial is received during a case manager's uh, interaction with a health plan, uh, then they can schedule something called a peer-to-peer -peer review where the plan doctor and the hospital doctor have a conversation to come to an agreement. And then of course there are laws that govern if a concurrent denial stands where the plan must assume care for the patient. And if they fail to do so, and the hospital continues to treat that patient until discharge, they're responsible until discharge or for the entire, the entire stay. And so we, we understand uh, the importance of the, the front part of the revenue cycle, those are our pre-reg, our registration, insurance verification, 
our admissions folks who are collecting demographics and requesting authorizations. And then our mid-cycle, which are our case managers, utilization review, following up those requests for authorizations and providing clinicals to ensure they have timely authorizations to be reimbursed for the services that they, that they provide. Um, uh, it's important that as a peer-to-peer -peer reviewer, uh, if you obtain a position on the mid-cycle uh, in, in revenue, uh, that you have the ability to uh, understand the importance of arranging a peer-to-peer -peer review with a competent reviewer. Uh, write this down under Health and Safety Code Section 1370.2. It states that uh, plans must provide a competent review of the services at issue. That means they must have the education and the expertise and the training to make that decision. Uh, my, my youngest son uh, went to, um, he plays football at UCLA right now. And when he was in high school, uh, we were down five in one game and uh, he, he took the, the snap, he was a quarterback and he um, shook the DN and ran down for a 50 yard touchdown and he landed in the end zone and his knee hit the turf and he suffered a PCL injury. Uh, uh, we went to a orthopedic surgeon who stated no surgery is needed, but he will need physical therapy and he will need a brace, a leg or knee brace for weight bearing activities. Well, the health plan approved physical therapy, but they denied the knee brace. They had no idea who they were dealing with at that time. Uh, so uh, we challenged the issue based on competency. In other words, an orthopedic surgeon ordered the knee brace, who denied it? We found out later that a pediatrician denied it as a result of the complaint that we filed with the State uh, Department of Managed Healthcare, the plan re-reviewed it with the orthopedic surgeon and they authorized the knee brace for weight bearing activities. Now, uh, he was a junior at the time. If you know of anyone that played football, the junior year is the most important year if you're gonna try to get an offer to go to college. But in addition to playing with the knee brace, man, just carrying a backpack in high school, that's a weight bearing activity. Have you, that, thing is, that thing is like 50 pounds. Uh, to make a long story short, we challenged on competency. Uh, we were not clinicians and we won the case. Uh, so we train doctors and nurses how to do the same in the revenue cycle. We train them how to create tools like the one on your screen, uh, which is a fax sheet to notify your patient is here and we need an authorization. And to ensure that we preserve the continuity of care, here are the timeframes you must respond to us to give us an authorization or the services are deemed statutorily authorized. We will go in and we'll shadow nurses and we'll shadow doctors and we'll understand what their uh, processes are, provide our findings and recommendations. And sometimes we'll provide something called documentation and rebuttal guidelines that's on your screen now. And we'll show them how to make the notification requesting an authorization. Uh, the importance of listing the health plan that was contacted, the department that was reached, name of the person you spoke with, phone number you dialed, that's important. Um, phone number of the last person you spoke with, the date, the start, and the end time of the call, the authorization, tracking, or reference number. And then, of course, we've also had a chance to show them how to respond when a competent review has not taken place. Uh, as you see there at the bottom, uh, we'll show them exactly how to notate in their system if the physician is not competent by going to the medical board in the state of California uh, and documenting the type of doctor they attempted to, uh, that attempted to conduct the peer-to-peer -peer review or that attempted to improperly deny the services for the patient. Uh, we were very busy during this last 2020 season uh, because of COVID. Uh, many of our provider members were trying to man their patient hotlines for people who were wondering if they had COVID. And so we were helping them secure authorizations. Uh, on the case that you're looking at now, you'll see that uh, in this case, two Medicare Advantage patients presented to one of our Washington trauma hospitals. And 
uh, the Medicare Advantage plans protocol prevented them from transferring the COVID patient to their hospital because the hospital that they were at or the system they were in already had a designated COVID facility. So uh, they were to go to the COVID facility, but here the plan refused to, um, uh, sorry, the plan could not transfer the patient because they weren't a COVID facility. Number two, they refused to issue an authorization. Uh, the solution, we, we wrote a letter uh, and we stated to the health plan that when we were contacting or when we contacted you for an authorization, you had 60 minutes to respond with a pre-approval. By failing to do so or to assume care of the patient or come to an agreement uh, with a peer-to-peer -peer review with the provider, uh, you're responsible for care up until the patient is discharged. Uh, we sent that in April of 2020. On the same day, the director responded with a demand stating that both cases have been approved for inpatient after a discussion with the hospitalist. Uh, and this is a copy of the letter that we actually sent to the plan to challenge this particular um, issue. And I wanna show you this because in the revenue cycle, you will be tasked to write powerful appeals on behalf of the provider. As you can see, uh, we start the letter by thanking the plan for their courageous response to the COVID pandemic. We then identify who we are and who we represent. In that third paragraph, we explain the story of what took place. Uh, the patient's exposure to a COVID positive individual that later resulted in them testing positive for COVID. Uh, we then explain the scenario where they've been notified of the patient's admission. Um, however, uh, Kaiser at the time of the plan had failed to issue a pre-approval within one hour of that request. We then quote the section of law that they have violated in terms of not responding timely to preserve continuity of care for this patient. Uh, we then uh, later state uh, a few things that we're concerned about. Uh, look at that second arrow on your screen. Uh, we were concerned that the plan refused to provide authorization for their COVID patients while maintaining that the patients could not be transferred. And we discussed the undue financial hardship this placed on the provider. And we asked for an immediate hard copy authorization to preserve the patient's care. That was sent, um, as I shared with you before, on April 3rd. Uh, on April 3rd, we received this from the doctor that stated, I've read your email below. Please address any further responses to only me. I am the accountable medical director for this policy. I'll review with my team and we will respond. Uh, later, we got this email that they had approved both patients for inpatient services. So, so we've talked to the importance about uh, the front end of the revenue cycle. Uh, and we've talked about the mid cycle uh, utilization review, case managers, peer-to-peer -peer reviewers, trying to preserve continuity of care similar to the case study on your screen. The final cycle of revenue is back in. And so we see uh, after utilization review, uh, charge capture or clinical documentation and coding, the claim submission icon until patient responsibility is the back end of revenue cycle. Uh, here is a copy of a UB that you might see uh, in a hospital system. And you'll see that uh, in that top right corner, if it's an inpatient case, you'll see a 111. If it's a uh, outpatient, you'll see a 131. Uh, now, this is the time card Hi. for providers to actually receive reimbursement from health plans. This is their time card. And in submitting this, you'll see a law at the very bottom, California HMO uh, timeframe law to reimburse claims, health and safety code section 1371 and 1371.35. It mandates that plans reimburse claims within 30 to 45 days. And when they fail to do it, it's a crime against public health and safety. It actually violates the public policy in the state of California. As we've gone over the revenue cycle, the three areas of the revenue cycle, the front, the mid, and the back end of the cycle, any questions so far? Any questions?
you can unmute yourself if you have a question of the first three parts of revenue cycle, front, mid, and back end. Any questions? Um, it's not really, a, sorry, it's not is it a question, but I was wondering if you can go back to that slide that had the cycle page on it. I was just writing down some notes. Thank you. That one there? Yeah, thank you. Appreciate You're it. so welcome. You're so welcome. So, so I want you to see that as she's writing down any, any questions, any comments, as she's writing that down. So you can see how what happens on the front end in registration, if we fail to get the wrong payer, if we miss a digit in the social security number, if the patient doesn't have their patient ID card and we can't identify who the payer is, any misstep in the front part of the revenue cycle can affect the entire revenue cycle. And so we teach the importance of students and providers to understand the impact from the beginning. We take them back to Genesis of how the patient arrived there. Patient arrived with severe crushing chest pains or patient arrived with gunshot wounds to the chest. We take them way back to the beginning to determine what they did early on. Did we call for an authorization? Did we document that call? Did the insurance company give us a reference or tracking number, but not an authorization? Now, that's important for us because as we move forward, we're going to understand that many times plans will give an authorization or tracking number when the law states they must give an authorization. And some of what we've taught you in this short period of time shows the provider how to ensure that they receive an authorization for the services they're going to provide. Because when they provide this UBO4 form, oftentimes they feel we're providing services on credit, right? We're providing services hoping that a healthcare service plan will reimburse this claim timely so we can ensure our hospital emergency rooms remain open. And so in revenue cycle leadership, we need three things. We need people, we need processes, and we need purpose. Uh, people, we need a machine, an army of people we can trust. And a machine or army of people who trust us. We talked earlier about the importance of building trust to earn permission to do our finest work. I want you to write that down. We build trust to earn permission to do our finest work. Uh, we earn our trust by being trustworthy, by being a consistent influence in the lives of people or a consistent resource. That means if you can't provide the answer you've created a network of resources or people where you can find the answer. We, we earn trust by seeing people as not just numbers or spreadsheets or dollars. By seeing patients as more than their social security or their policy number or the amount of a claim, but seeing the human story connected to that patient's care. We earn trust by fearlessly giving ourselves away, expecting nothing in return. By being passionate healthcare professionals. And no one can pay you to be passionate. If you're not passionate about what you do, no one else will be passionate about the work that you do. And when you're passionate about something, no one can pay you a high amount to be more passionate or pay you a low amount to be less passionate because it's intrinsic in you. This is what you were called to do. It's not a job, but it's a calling, it's a duty, it's a responsibility to impact the lives of people that cannot fight for themselves. When people trust you, they will not only work for you, but they will follow you. They will give you permission to do your finest work to carry them in seasons when they cannot carry themselves. 
Uh, we also, in addition to people, we need, as I mentioned before, processes. We need processes. A system of processes of how we're building and releasing and sustaining and evolving our business and department model. We have a philosophy here at EARN that Juliana will tell you about is to inspect what we expect. Uh, if we send a request for an authorization to a health plan and the health plan doesn't respond uh, that same day so we can preserve the continuity of care and two weeks pass, sometimes I've had new people uh, or old people tell me, oh, well, I sent it, but I never heard from the health plan. No, 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 no. Did you inspect what you expected? Because I'm not waiting for another party on the end of the phone in another location who might be going through their own challenges in the pandemic, working remotely, to find your number in your case and make a call. I expect you to be accountable and to inspect what you expect. Because our philosophy here is also everything is our fault. Everything is management's fault. Um, we, we refuse to ignore the data. Uh, if an employee repeatedly fails to meet appeal timeframes or a statute of limitation timeframe expires or if they violate HIPAA uh, or if they violate the attendance policy, they can't come to work on time. If they engage in professional shortcoming, whose fault is it? Well, we say it's our fault because we hired them. Uh, we failed to discipline and reinforce training. Uh, if they're a repeat offender, we kept them on board rather than reassign or release them. Uh, as leaders, we must take accountability for what is and what is not happening in our area of responsibility. We must learn to get the wrong people off the bus and the right people out of the wrong seats on the bus. Uh, sometimes you simply have someone in the wrong department or in the wrong position and their skill set should be placed elsewhere. We do this by creating processes and systems to make sure that people are trained and cross-trained within the organization. We uh, walk and we'll go on site and we'll shadow doctors and nurses and professionals and we'll help them create processes for KPIs, the number of calls that someone should make in the revenue cycle, uh, the number of appeals they should write on a daily basis, uh, what their success overturn rate is when they're challenging issues. Are they successful? We don't want people here with a false sense of accomplishment. Do they have a propensity for results? Uh, and when we travel and, and we shadow doctors and nurses, I mean, we really go deep with it. You'll see on your screen, um, we will uh, shadow the front end, uh, the mid-cycle. We will give them findings and recommendations. Mid-cycle metrics will create flow charts and processes. Earlier, I showed you the documentation and rebuttal guidelines that we'll create. We'll create appeal letters, fax cover sheets, you are fax cover sheets. Uh, here's an example of uh, actual mid-cycle or front-end, rather, flow chart that leads to the mid-cycle as well. And we created this on-site with the hospital within seven days, just shadowing their people and their folks. Uh, and we start, uh, again, at Genesis, right? In the beginning, uh, patient presents to the hospital ED, then it goes to the patient access technician, who is, in essence, a glorified insurance verifier, uh, I would feel great if someone called me a patient access technician instead of an insurance verifier. I really like that title, actually. Um, the ER doctor and hospitalist. Uh, then, of course, when it goes to the health unit secretary, who is responsible to make sure that timely notification took place. And then the UM insurance verification authorization specialist, et cetera. These are the processes that we've created. We've helped them create processes for when a plan's requesting uh, medical records. Uh, if they should provide medical records and when it's unlawful, when it's an unlawful request to submit the medical records. Well, in what scenario would that be? If a plan issued an authorization and now they're requesting medical records, we have one simple thing that we'll share to the plan. Mr. Kaiser, please be advised that your request for medical records has been denied because on January 15th, we called you requesting an authorization. Um, you issued an authorization on that date 
and then later requested medical records to do a retrospective medical review that's unlawful in the state of California per Health and Safety Code Section 1371.8. Or if we've called and they failed to respond with an authorization. Mr. Health Plan, on January 15th, we called you to request an authorization. We faxed you. We sent clinicals on this state, this state, and this state. You failed to respond within 30 minutes or before the patient was discharged, statutorily authorizing the entire state. We showed them how to create processes just like that to impact the lives of people that cannot speak for themselves because we are intent to build an army of giant killers. People who will fight for the underdog, who will fight for the right to be seen in emergency room settings in some of the worst days of their life. So we need people, we need processes, lastly, we need purpose. We need to have a purpose and a vision of where we're going. As a healthcare administration student, where are you going after graduation? Where will you make your imprint? Where will you leave your mark? Because you and I have no right to live purposeless and visionless lives. Success deceives us into thinking that our vision can succeed without people, processes, and discipline. But pursuing a vision is violent work. It is intentional. It requires you to march in territory that you're unfamiliar with. It requires you to be enlarged and stretched to do things you've never been trained to do to self-educate yourselves, to learn that oftentimes how you self-educate yourself with the foundation of what you received from your professors helps you not only earn a living, but make a fortune. Pursuing vision instills core values to create culture. Culture is simply this, this is what we'll do. This is what we will not do in this organization. Did you know that how we arrange workstations, how we establish management philosophy, open door policies, all contribute to culture that people can thrive in? We have determined to build a culture of compliance in the revenue cycle, a culture of you before me, a culture of inspecting what we expect, a culture of accountability. We have a model in our office that says we're always, the auditor is always auditing the auditor. We're always looking for something that someone missed, if possible, to fix it. A culture that constantly asks, how are we doing things differently and better today than we did yesterday? We have an internship program with three of the Cal States. And one of the expectations I have for our interns is I'm looking to see if they give thought to you and if they make inquiries about the feasibility of a new or different course of action. In other words, my expectation is complete the task or make it better. As we prepare to close this session tonight, how will you, what do you need? complete your training and go into a season of your life where you revolutionize the healthcare delivery system. What will you write in the next chapter of your life? As healthcare leaders, we must be powerful storytellers. Um, I've just written a book called Be a Giant Killer, and I'll show you that shortly. But I've learned you can't write a book without a storyline. And you can't have a story without a plot. And you can't have a plot without a twist. Otherwise, it will be boring, it'll be predictable and uninspiring. And the greatest stories keep you on the edge of your seat. Keep each person hanging on the next word, the next act, the next scene, or what you will do next. 
And I want to encourage you as a student that the healthcare delivery system, the people, the processes, and vision will be in your hands only for a season. And how you navigate the healthcare delivery system will impact your future children, your future grandchildren, those that come behind you to rely on access to medically appropriate care. People need to know how you lived when you died. They need to know how you fought, how you advocated for people who could not fight for themselves, how you changed healthcare administration, how when you left the job, people said there was no one like him or her. I encourage you as you build the next chapters of your life, healthcare administration, make the next chapters be the best chapters. Some of you have already followed me on LinkedIn. I saw some of you today who followed me. I wanna encourage you to follow me there on LinkedIn. You'll find uh, some very interesting things that we place up there when we're challenging revenue cycle and we're teaching providers administrative laws. And we also have great inspirational stuff as well listed there. Um, you're looking at a copy of the first book that I've published called Be a Giant Killer. And I just wanna encourage you in this season um, to join us online, join our movement. We wanna follow your career as you succeed in healthcare administration. I've given you a contact page as well. Um, again, I was thrilled to just join you in this session. I wanna just stop for a moment to ask if you have any questions before I let you go. Hi, Ed, um, I have a quick question. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you know, given your 20 years or more than 20 years of experience uh, as a chief compliance officer, what would you say is the most important skill to have as a leader? Man, you know what? I, I really think that leaders must be accountable. We talked about inspecting what we expect. Uh, leaders must have the ability to have great accountability, great transparency, and really be able to say, man, I was wrong. We have a we have a motto, hashtag, I was wrong in our office from time to time. We want to teach people how to take accountability for their failures, because I'll be honest with you, we grew up in a bit of a generation where um, uh, uh, we, we gave our children uh, in, uh, what was it called, uh, participation trophies. They came in last place, they got a trophy. And, and that can lead to a sense of entitlement. And we want to make sure that leaders around us are very accountable. They have great attention to detail and they have strong time management skills. Uh, in other words, in healthcare and in compliance, there are many moving parts and you have to have the skill, write this down, of shifting priorities. The ability to shift priorities and be able to re-engage with the previous priority when you remove from one uh, is crucial to succeed in healthcare. Great question. Any other questions? Yes, I actually have a question. Sure. Can you describe what the most challenging compliance problems you face in your career and how did you handle it? You know, laws are constantly changing. And, um, you know, we, we have a technology division that we create appeal letters and demand letters. And um, man, in Medicare Advantage, they change annually. And one of our um, segments or modules of that technology program hadn't been updated with, with, a, um, with, with a particular law that was changed. And one of our attorney users caught it and shared it with us. So we have to consistently be on top of, of laws that are constantly changing and shifting the landscape of how we do healthcare. Uh, it's also very, very important for us to make sure that we maintain our skills in compliance. Uh, you know, you've heard of the phrase probably, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. That's true. Um, it's important that you consistently sharpen yourself uh, in uh, not just learning administrative laws or compliance regulations, but also applying them, finding outlets to create um, resources that assimilate those administrative laws into your healthcare delivery system. Otherwise, you can find that um, it can get the, the knowledge can get stale. And I've been in those scenarios where I've been in a session and someone asked me a question and um, I wasn't ready for it. And I made a decision that in that one moment when I wasn't ready for it, 
that the next time someone asks me for that, I'll never be in that position ever again. And so just being on top of administrative laws that are constantly changing how we do healthcare, uh, that's probably been the biggest challenge. Great question. Thank you. And we actually have a question in the chat box. Um, they're asking if a patient has more than one insurance plan, can this cause issues with the flow of the reimbursement cycle? Um, if they have like a primary and secondary insurance plan, yes, because you'll have a primary that will kick in and pay a portion of themselves. And certain payers, if it's a government payer, may not pay anything as a secondary. Um, so uh, multiple plans can have an impact on reimbursement. We've had some scenarios where providers were paid by a, um, uh, there was a tort fees involved. A patient was in an accident, someone hit them. And uh, because they obtained an attorney, they were able to get a settlement from the insurance company. And it was more than Medi-Cal. And, and at, some, at, some, at some point, um, there are some challenges of, of if they um, had to, or when they had to bill or refund Medi-Cal because the tort fees or payment kicked in, if they could legally do that or not. I think just recently we had a case where someone had the VA and Medicare and Medicare paid the claim, but the VA was primary and the VA pays less, pays 70% of Medicare. So they had to refund Medicare once they received the VA payment. It makes a huge impact. That's a great question. Any other questions? Hi, Ed. Uh, my name is Josie. This is not a question. It's just more so of a, a gratitude. You know, I, I really have to thank you. Um, I've been in the health, healthcare industry for more than 20 years. And, and obviously, I've been in this uh, for this long because I'm really passionate about helping those that are in need. And, wow. um, you know, it, it's it's you're talking at a perfect time. Um, obviously there's things that stay with you within the talk. Yeah. And one of the things that I truly appreciate what you said is uh, cultivating a, a culture that's passionate about being able to help people. Wow. Um, I know wow. this is too much information, but I lost my sister last year and um, oh, so it was sorry. really hard just so to sorry. find that passion again for wow. those that really needed. And I wow. saw how much, um, how much she, needed help when she was um, going through the process of her wow. her treatments and so um you know i found myself just uh, thinking oh my goodness if i work in a healthcare industry and obviously i'm able to get um get the help for my sister um but those that don't know the healthcare system it's yeah. so unfortunate because they don't yes. have that person that that's yeah. the advocate uh, for them that can ad advocate for them and that can really get them the right treatment or the right um, doctors in order for them to um, get the, uh, the help, right? Wow. Um, so I really, really, really thank you for, for those words that you said, we need to create a, a, a culture that's wow. passionate about the healthcare. I love what you're sharing. Thank you for being so transparent and sharing your heart. Your story literally moves me just hearing you and I can hear how special and precious she was to you. And I really believe that that's going to be a part of your story that you're going to be able to grow out of and build and create a career that impacts the lives of people in memory of her because of her impact, her influence. You'll be able to influence the lives of people that you may never meet. You might talk to them. You might see their names on a claim form. You might see their names in an appeal process, but you'll have the ability to impact those people and know that you made a difference and this is really important. Watch this. A four-year degree will give you information, but it will not give you conviction. And the conviction that you work in, that you have just described in this moment, will give you the ability to change multitudes of lives. I want to thank you for just sharing that with me. Such a, such a profound story. And uh, my prayers to you and your family as you guys continue to remember her in a profound way. Thank you so much, Ed. Those words mean so much to me. You're welcome. Any other questions? It's going to be hard to go behind her. I mean, she, that, that was so powerful. I had a question. 
Sure. So my question just is about like turnaround times with this um, specifically more like in your situation with your son, how obviously, you know, all the like regulations and laws and codes. So sure. you knew that you could go and request to get that, like your son needed that brace oh, but absolutely. for people. Uh, so like your turnaround time. So when you fight something like that, or when a patient's or, or a patient's significant significant other or someone with them fights these things how long is the turnaround time for that uh that, that's such a great question so in the state of california a good example for hmos hmos have a certain amount of time frame to respond to authorization requests so the care for my son was considered prospective care it was before he received the services if the patient was in the hospital, it would be concurrent care while they're receiving the services. If the patient was already discharged, it would be retrospective care. So in prospective scenarios, um, if for my son, he wasn't in, in an ER, uh, so the 30 minute rule didn't apply in terms of turnaround. But uh, in a non-urgent setting of prospective care, uh, they have anywhere between three to five days to respond with an authorization. Uh, let's say if the services were already provided and we were now fighting an improper denial, well, plans can take up until 45 days to respond with um, a decision uh, to your appeal. Now, I'm a bit crazy. Uh, uh, Juliana would tell you that uh, because I have a propensity for results so that when I go and shadow hospitals, I tell them, I want you to give me your hardest case, your biggest denial, your biggest issue where a patient's been denied inappropriate care, or I'm sorry, been denied medically appropriate care rather. And um, I wanna try to see if we can't resolve it in the five days I'll be with you this week. Now I don't have to do that. I could tell them, hey, we'll write the appeal, we'll challenge the health plan, and then in 45 days, you'll get a response. But that doesn't challenge me. And I believe in the importance of creating a sense of urgency for decisions that should have been made initially. And so um, uh, it, with my son, for instance, we got an authorization back within three days. Uh, with other cases, uh, you'll find that um, if you go to our Earn Enterprise YouTube page, there's a story about Hudson who um, had one leg 11 inches shorter than the other. And we had to go to an ALJ hearing and take the state of California um, uh, to, to task. And we won that case and we we're able to get him a leg lengthening surgery out of state. Uh, but uh, there are time frames that govern what you've just shared. Uh, three to five days, if, if it's prospective, uh, if it's in the ER for post-stabilization care, uh, uh, after an emergency service has been issued or a condition has been stabilized, it's 30 minutes to respond with an authorization. Uh, if the patient is getting uh, ongoing care in the hospital and you need concurrent authorizations, it's that same three to five days again. And if the patient's already gone and you've written an appeal, they can take up to 45 days. But uh, if you've been inspired by anything I tell you today, uh, you can beat some of those time frames when you get to the right person who has the same passion and same convictions to do the right thing. Great question. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments? Uh, yes, I think we have one more question in the chat box. Um, they're asking, has the pandemic complicated the reimbursement cycle more and how are COVID patients treated? Are they considered a high priority or does it depend on their condition? Oh, such a great question. Um, that's two questions in one, by the way. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. I like what you did there. That's very interesting. Um, I have seen in the pandemic certain federal agencies really step up to the plate. Um, the VA... Uh, it, you know, it, there's a, if you look up the VA and you'll find little taglines that says deny, deny until they die. And you'll find that veterans have been waiting for uh, appointments for years and before they can get the care from the VA that they expire. And um, in the pandemic, we've seen them respond tremendously well, along with, uh, um, with Medicare and Medicare Advantage plans. Um, Medicare has really cracked down to make sure that frontline emergency providers have the resources that they need to treat patients at high risk in the pandemic. Uh, and there have been other payers that have done different things to step up to the plate. 
um, Kaiser, United Healthcare, they've done um, great things to, to make sure that patients were, were covered and they didn't have to worry about COVID tested and screening, uh, things like that. Uh, and some that we've had to remind, we're still in a pandemic. We've had to remind of their duty and their obligation to ensure uh, the continuous provision of healthcare in the state of California and the state that they, that they represent. Um, so it has been, uh, it's, it's been great to see some of the healthcare components come together to ensure that we can keep hospitals open. Uh, but there are some problem seeds and, and that we have to take to the altar of compliance. And while we carry them to the altar of compliance, they're squirming and we're trying to put them on the altar and they're moving and, uh, and we're just trying to make sure that they do what the law affords. We simply ask for justice, what the law affords, nothing less, nothing more. Um, when it comes to how they can, how they, how they might reimburse, um, we have, or in terms of how patients can get care in the pandemic, um, we're really super involved with our hospital providers nationwide. So if a patient, as I showed you in that one case study, uh, has, been, has received a COVID diagnosis, and they're having a problem getting authorization, we will immediately get involved. We will not wait for a denial on the back end. Many providers, by the way, they will wait until, uh, if they're treating the patient, they get a denial concurrently from a health plan, they will continue to treat the patient, and then they will wait until they bill the claim to the health plan, receive the denial, and then challenge it. No, 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 we, we don't do that. We will fight concurrently because we understand the importance of accelerating authorization and revenue capture. And the sooner we can get the authorization, the sooner we can prevent an improper denial that has a negative impact on a patient's quality of care. Great question. Great two questions. Great way to get those in. Thank you. We have one more question. Are there any compliance hotlines where patients who have been victimized in the healthcare setting can contact to seek counsel? Oh, great question. So um, for my son who plays for UCLA, um, we actually had to go through, uh, the Department of Managed Healthcare has a, um, what is it? They have a uh, provider complaint unit where you can file complaints under health and safety code section 1371.39. That gives a healthcare provider the ability to provide, uh, to submit a complaint to a complaint unit. But they also have a help center. And uh, it is 1888, I'm sorry, 1888 HMO 2219. 1888 HMO 2219. And that help center is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, where anyone in a hospital setting can obtain advocacy from the state of California when they feel their patient rights have been violated. Uh, for Medicare Advantage patients, um, you'll find that they have rights under the QIO process, um, Quality Improvement Organization, and it's under 42 CFR 422.622.622. And, and that section of law governs that they can challenge any attempt of the health plan to discharge them prematurely. And while they challenge it and have a, a QIO review of that discharge, they can remain in the hospital. Great questions. Thank you. And we have one more. Sure. Uh, if they wanted to become a compliance officer, how should they start being as a gen junior undergraduate student? Uh, great question. So it's very interesting. Um, I have lectured in healthcare administration programs and I've lectured in medical billing schools. I've lectured in doctor's programs and many programs don't teach extensively on administrative laws. And so uh, one of the things that we encourage, you know, we do uh, before the pandemic, of course, we did two training certified training sessions per year where providers and students could come in and they could learn how to advocate for medically appropriate healthcare using administrative laws. 
Um, we've recently moved to Costa Mesa. We have a larger training center, but we won't reopen our, our I guess, you know, restart our live training until next year. We've had some people pushing us to do virtual stuff. And, um, you know, who knows if we're, you know, God forbid we're still going through this next year, but uh, if for some reason we might pull the trigger and do something virtual, or at least to this extent, when we do a, an in-person session here, we'll do virtual seats as well. But we provide a great um, compliance training course called the Professional Claims Compliance uh, Course. And we train providers, uh, nurses, doctors, healthcare financial professionals, healthcare administration students, medical billing students for 20 years. And, and also I can share this though, it's really you just learning to own your own growth and jumping into administrative laws to learn how they govern the healthcare delivery system. Um, one of our desires and, and dreams in the future is to have the ability to, on a more frequent basis, um, teach in some of the universities that we've had access to in the past to ensure that they're able to understand this side of healthcare administration, revenue cycle leadership. Um, I, also, let me give you two great organizations that you must consider joining uh, in healthcare. One is called HFMA, um, and uh, the other is called AHAM, A-A-H-A, A-A-H-A-M. Uh, uh, um, and you're going to ask me to, to tell you what that stands for. I know it. Um, HFMA is um, Healthcare Financial Management Association. And AHAM is the administrative, um, I'm forgetting right now, administrative, Juliana, you should know this, administrative, the Association of Administrative Hospital something management. I'm forgetting it. Uh, and here's the thing about it. I belong to it. I'm a member I speak for them, I write for them, and it's such a long name, I've completely forgotten. Uh, but AHAM and HFMA are great organizations to join uh, because you can get some of this education that involves revenue cycle and administrative laws there as well. And just by being a volunteer, rolling your sleeves up, touching the lives of people, um, you'll find that your ability to network and find jobs, your transition in between jobs will be shorter when you're part of great organizations like um, NCRA, because we do our own training here, AHAM and HFMA. Sorry for the very long response. It was AHAM's fault. I couldn't remember what it stands for. Any other questions, comments? Well, listen, I want to thank you for just the opportunity to spend time with you tonight, to speak into your, to your homes, to your cars. Um, as you're walking outside in the park, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I, I really count it a privilege to do this work, to pour and invest into people like yourself. And um, I can't wait to see what you do next. Please follow me on LinkedIn. I'd love to connect with you and follow your career and make sure you know when training sessions um, uh, will uh, start again with us. And um, of course, you'll find information on my first book there as well, Be a Giant Killer. Um, thank you for having me, all the professors, all the HCA team members. It's been a blast. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. We really appreciate. Yeah, thank, thank you very you much. So much. That was very thank inspirational. You. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you, you, Ed. Thank you. Thank you. And I actually have a quick question. Um, since you're recording the uh, meeting right now, do you think you can send over the recording to Juliana? Did I record it accidentally? Um, it just says that you're recording since you're the host. I'm not oh, sure. Let me see.
I, I'm so glad you shared that with me. I had no idea I was recording. Well, it does say recording, so I will ask. Oh, no, I, I, I'm, I'm still recording. Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, no worry. I just noticed okay. right now. Okay. Think, uh, yeah. Uh, she, she, she scared me. She scared me for a minute there because I, I, I didn't know I was recording, but I have no idea what I'm doing. And I would have my IT person come in and tell me what I recorded. Uh, it'd be a secret recording uh, that we'd somehow get to you. But if you don't have it, I'll have Juliana check into our copy. Let us know. We're here for you guys. Okay. Thank you. Is there a way you can um, make, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Brenda the host? Do you know how to? Uh, yeah, I think let's so. let's yeah. see. I, I, I'm still the host, huh? Is there is there a request that she would ask of me or no? If you click on my name and there's like three little dots, I think you can. Uh... Oh, I see you. I see you, Brenda. Okay, let's see here. Brenda, I click your name. It says make host. It yeah. says make host. Wow, you're a great trainer, Brenda. Great trainer. <laughs> great trainer. Wow. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Thank you so much again, honestly. Thank you so much for coming and spending time with us. We really do appreciate it. Hey, and don't worry, you. they did me the same way about that recording in last week. <laughs> yeah, we're learning <laughs> every day. Oh, goodness. Thank you, guys. Thank